can, like a third grader. So I can see and hear Matt. You can hear me now? Yes. Yay. Oh, miracle of miracles. I I can push this aside because I think you're hearing me. Hey, can you hear yeah. me tap on that? No. Nope. No. Yeah. That's because I switched over to the built-in mic on the webcam, which means the audio won't be nearly as good. But, hey, I'm here and happy to join Yay. you. Good afternoon to you guys. It's good morning here. I think my system got messed up because 10 minutes ago, I was recording my boss, Bill Nye, for his weekly contribution to Planetary Radio via Skype. And I think it screwed up the system. So sorry about that, but I'm glad I could join you. No, it's fine. Welcome. And uh, I've mentioned you a couple times in the show when we've brought up the Alma trip. So yes. We got a large millimeter ray where uh, you I and I. Kind of remember that. Out. Yeah, in spite of the that. lack of oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel right now lack of sleep, lack of oxygen. We were sitting in the bus at 16,000 feet. Yeah. Man, what's the name of that movie about the big radio telescope? It's got a really simple name. You should have kept your little can of oxygen. You could use a hit right now. <laughs> that would be fine if I superoxygenated my brain. But we couldn't think of the name of the movie, The Dish. Oh, for yes, like five right. Five right, minutes right. Uh -huh. in the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting there trying to figure out the name of this movie. It's a really simple word. I don't know. <laughs> spoon. It's Spoon. Do you remember that movie? Spoon. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of how I feel right now. So, after <laughs> being awake all day. So, yeah. so if, if people have no idea who this Matt Kaplan person is who who's joined us, and Matt, I don't think we've ever actually met in, in we haven't met in person yet. I don't think we've even met on Hangout yet. So it's great. Oh, to, uh, I think we all met at DragonCon a couple of years ago because he got the parsec instead of us. As usual, <laughs> I but I don't think we met. That's right. Yeah, right. so if I, I ever didn't, I, I had a nice talk with Pamela there, but you're right, we didn't really yeah, talk. Yeah. And I think we've talked at least once or twice uh, elsewise in the virtual world here. But, in the virtual world, yeah. But yeah, very nice to finally join you uh, in, in service to Cos CosmoQuest. And so you do a wonderful, I would even say Parsec winning uh, radio <laughs> show. Because it is a Parsec winning. <laughs> I know, every time he beats us. Um, only once, uh, only once. Only once. <laughs> That's uh, that's all I need to hear. Um, I was in good yeah. company. But, uh, yeah, so why don't you let people know about your awesome radio show, because it is awesome. Thank you. That's very kind. Uh, well, the awesome radio show is Planetary Radio, and uh, we've been on for like ten and a half years now. Uh, on about 150 public radio stations, we're on Sirius XM. I just found out. They never communicate with you. They don't tell you anything. I just found out we're on three times a week with them. So if you wow. have satellite radio in the car, you can check us out. You may know more about us being on there than they tell us. Um, <laughs> but like you guys, most of our audience now is online. It's the podcast. It's amazing. You know, even with that level of broadcast coverage, uh, how important and uh, how enthusiastic, how passionate the uh, online audience is, as you guys hopefully are proving with this event that people are no doubt watching and wondering, just like when they listen to public radio, when they say that people should give money, they don't mean me, do they? Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we, we do. mean you, because this is your opportunity right now. I, Pamela, I told you I was going to hit this like pitching for public radio. So I, I'm that's, good, that's my I'm good with that. Good. I'm glad. So uh, it is the weekly broadcast series, half-hour series from the Planetary Society, where my boss is Bill Nye, the science guy. He's our CEO. And every week, almost every week, Bill does a little segment. We do a little dialogue, and that's what I just recorded with him. But we've got your friend and colleague, Emily Lakdawalla, who's uh, also my colleague at the Society. And uh, she does a weekly thing with the show, and, and we'll be doing... Uh, a live version of the show, Planetary Radio Live, uh, again next week uh, with somebody almost from your neck of the woods, a guy named uh, Peter Mayer is going to come out, a great folk singer who writes songs that are more in touch with, really capture the, the, the awe and wonder, the passion, beauty, and joy, as Bill Nye says, of what we love about all this stuff uh, in music. He just does a tremendous job. And uh, so Emily will be up on stage with him, and we just we have a great time. Uh, this the show I'm working on now for next week will feature uh, Matt Gollumbeck of uh, JPL, the uh, sort of czar of Martian landing sites, and uh, it's a lot of fun. We have a great time doing it. And and I have to pause to interrupt you to to share some of the comments that we've been getting. Uh, we have from Leah Crane. I wish at CosmoQuest X Hangoutathon was all the time, so I could just tune in <laughs> yeah. whenever I want oh, to hear geez. casual chats about science by experts. And uh, Guido Bubra, whose name I will pronounce differently and wrong every time I see Guido it. Guido Bubra. It's not Guido. 
It's Guido. 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 Uh, so he Scrooge writes. Here. <laughs> so so he writes, and he may have just changed his mind. Uh, Fraser, Matt, Nicole, and Pamela, the dream team of science and oh, astronomy. Hey. Oh, that's very kind. I'm so sad you you didn't join us for our community hour. I know you didn't have the the webcam for it, but uh, we you've been with us most of the sh most of the show, man. So rock on. <laughs> um. So so I, now we're going to sort of turn this conversation, the conversation we're about to have, into an episode of Astronomy Cast. So I hope that's all right, and we're gonna sort of put sure. that out the feed. So we're gonna it's try an and we're gonna try and sort of have a certain amount of structure, and the structure is I that. Turn off the ball. I will attempt to try to corral you and Pamela and Nicole into some kind of direction that, that sort of matches my whims and interest in this. So the topic that we're going to discuss is combating misinformation with the media. And I know that you have been dealing with this for, as you said, for, you know, 10 plus years, uh, even more the the more than uh, when you've been doing it with Planetary Radio. Pamela's been dealing with it. I've been dealing with it. And so I think this is, this is fantastic. And I think our, our good friend Phil Plate has been sort of, you know, has based a whole career. He's made a career out of it. A career yeah. out of combating yeah. misinformation. So there is a tremendous, it is a bottomless well that just gives and gives of <laughs> misinformation out there in, in the media. So so I think um, I would love to sort of get from Matt, I'd love to understand sort of how you have been ex sort of experiencing and combating misinformation in the media. Can you give us some sort of great to, uh, when, did, when did you do say was your first moment of, of tackling some kind of misinformation in, in your work? Oh, uh, it goes back way before planetary radio. And, you know, you're so right that uh, all of us have to deal with this because the moment you are held up or hold yourself up as, as uh, not an authority, because I'm certainly not, I'm just a reporter, uh, but as somebody who's connected with any of this, of course, you know, that the tinfoil hats start coming out. Uh, and not just the tinfoil hats, but the people who are making a living off of this stuff. Uh, and it's, it's unavoidable. And it's... Um, Striking that, it, it's really striking a balance, I think, because you have people who are incredibly sincere about their feelings, about this, you know, their their abduction experience or that face on Mars, or I guess I should say the lizard nowadays. Uh, and, um, uh, th and that's the vast majority of these folks. I mean, they really want to believe. Uh, and as soon as I started to be affiliated with this kind of stuff, I used to get questions from friends. I mean, I have a very good friend who shall go nameless, who has a, a theater company here in town. Very smart person, is another radio personality, very well-known radio personality. And uh, she and her boyfriend, they're not, uh, they're probably atheists, probably, I think. Um, they're certainly not religious. And I talked to them about this once because they actually asked me, they said, so, you know, you must know what's going on with, uh, uh, you're probably hearing funny sounds there. I'm going to shut off my mail client. They said, you must, you can level with us. You must hear things about, you know, the saucers. Uh, and, um, and I said, guys, no, no more than you do. And with no more credibility than you do, which is no, none at all. Uh, I said, but let me ask you something. You're not very religious but you believe in alien abductions? And they said, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's a big universe. It must be happening. I said, but, and they, and they said, and, you know, you must know scientists who uh, know all about this stuff, and they're covering it up. And I usually respond with the same line I use today, which is that, no, I mean, every scientist I know who works in space science would love to be the first to say, we have found life elsewhere in the universe, much mm -hmm. less intelligent life. And so they would jump on this if they thought they had good evidence, uh, if they thought they had reproducible data. Uh, and it's just sadly not there. And uh, you really, the guy who I think gave the best advice on this was a moment of silence, Carl Sagan, uh, mm -hmm. because he was the one who said that, you know, it doesn't really always pay off for us to be snide skeptics and make fun in, of these folks and belittle them, although I've done my share. Uh, it's really uh, trying to use this as a way to bring them into the fold, to help them understand the true wonder of science and the miracles that are going on in science all around us 
every day. I mean, we live in a golden age of space science, to say nothing of the other sciences. And, you know, people, there's plenty there to be excited about. Uh, and, you know, who knows, maybe someday E.T. will phone home, but um, it just <laughs> hasn't happened yet. And that's very different from dealing with the people who deserve a punch in the nose. Thank you, Buzz Aldrin, for actually <laughs> making good on that. Uh, because there are the people who, you know, have found a way to make a living off of lying to folks about this. The worst offender being Fox Television. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yes. Yeah. The, now, back Pamela, when have, that. Pamela, have you got a sort of, you know, some early anecdotes of, of when you've been combating misinformation in, in uh, astronomy? I, you know, I think for me it's it's been a matter of uh, a lot of the, the same sorts of things, the... Um, well, I heard Mars is going to be bigger than the moon. I I heard that um, there were aliens seen over Moscow. Um, there's so many different things that crop up um, that that it gets so easy to get excited about, and at a certain point, my brain just starts rejecting the notion of sticking them into long-term memory. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. it's this co constant background den that you learn to stop listening to the same way I've stopped listening to this air conditioner and I only hear it when it turns off. Um, there's so much misinformation out there that you get used to knowing every time you bring up relativity in front of a crowd, someone's going to come up and say no. You get used to the fact that every time you bring up Big Bang, someone's going to say no. And, and you just you take it on the chin and you try and explain what the real universe is actually like. And that, you know, science is so awesome, why bother with the fiction? Exactly. Yeah, I've got two. I've got two anecdotes. I think are 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 sort of relevant to this. I mean, you know, I had probably got into it by reading Phil's work and really started to realize, you know, the battles he was doing with Planet X and Nibiru yeah. and all of that that was going on. But it sort of came close to home for me when I started to get emails back, and I think it was two thousand and three, from this Mars bigger than the Moon oh, yeah. email that was running around, and I was getting dozens a day of people like is it true are we going to be able to see Mars bigger than the moon and I was like no, no. and they're like okay fine let's write an article on, on Universe Today and let's try and sort of battle this head on that and that was sort of interesting realizing that I now had a bunch of work to do just be, as you said by putting myself up as someone who was knowledgeable in this area but I think that the thing that for it turned into a moral imperative for me was what happened with 2012. Yeah. All of the people who were, you know, a few years before, like as early as like 2008, 2009, were starting to write these, um, these articles about how 2012 was going to be all kinds of horrible calamities were going to happen, and I was getting emails from like 13-year-olds who were terrified out of their mind that they weren't going to live another couple of years, that they had been so freaked out by these forums and articles and, and podcasts and all this kind of stuff that was just creating this self-referential nightmare. And, and, and so what we had, you know, we just took, we tackled as best we could and just, you know, wrote a whole series of like 10 or 15 articles debunking each one of these concepts that had been bandied about so that when a person you know, sent me this email, I could direct them over to this article that we had done. And then people are like, oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad. I was so scared. And, and this is one of the things I really respect about the work you do. I, I don't know how many different times I, I've seen you, and I know you hate Twitter, but I've seen you going on Twitter and dealing with the people who saw Venus in the sky and kind of panicked, who saw this weird... Uh, fairly rare alignment of the moon and a couple of planets um, who saw the stuff that Mars would be big and you go on and you do the Google searches and you combat it until Twitter bans you. And yeah, then, I'll break Twitter. I hate Twitter, but I am also able to break it um, on it. that on that front for sure. So, so I so I think Matt, do you think that we're oh Nicole, you've got so right. It's also Nicole. <laughs> also Nicole. The Thanks, noisiest Fraser. astronomer was silent. <laughs> Waiting. Waiting. We're, depend we're depending on you, Fraser, as the person who got I some sleep. I, I, I probably got a little more than uh, these folks, but I I was at a They Might Be Giants concert until oh, very late last night. You. So I, I know. I'm, I'm really boasting, but uh, it, it was, oh, um, it was it kept me out late.
Yeah. Nicole. Yeah, so I came at it from the other side. I was a total believer in high school. At the same time I was getting, yes, jaw drop. Uh, same time that I was getting into astronomy and space science really heavily, uh, I was also watching all these shows on the Sci-Fi Channel. Should have gotten the hint from Sci-Fi uh, about uh, all these UFO sightings, and and I really wanted aliens to be real. And and I think I had the internet for the first time because you know that's when we finally got the internet in, my, in our house. And the first thing you do is you go on the, the search engines of the time, the pre-Googles, uh, and, and you see all these these websites that are breathlessly talking about abduction experiences and sightings in the sky. And I was swept up in that for a little while until I kind of got bored, I guess. I got <laughs> tired of this tantalizing, breathless, oh my gosh, isn't that amazing, without finding the evidence to back it up. And so I slowly fell out of that. And a few years later, found myself on the other side when I was um, a summer student at the Very Large Array in New Mexico. And people would come up to me when I, I was a the summer student, so I'll have to do at least a couple days as a tour guide. And people would ask me, so what's the deal with UFOs? Are you guys tracking UFOs? Are you guys uh, getting signals from, from other planets? And uh, one woman said, um, after my tour, totally just talking about astronomy, said, you know, I've been abducted. You you get those buggers for me. And so I, I saw it completely from the other side and, and have been uh, trying to deal with it in, you know, like like you mentioned, the, Carl Sagan had a, a compassionate sort of skepticism, especially about the, the UFO and abduction phenomena um, because there's, there's really something going on and it's probably not people being probed by humanoid beings from outer space, but there's uh, some kind of, of psychological thing happening and, and spreading from person to person that uh, needs to be looked at and, and taken with care. It's our it's our demon haunted world, as it Carl is. put it. Yes. And uh, the you know the accounts from the Middle Ages, from uh, the women who were being tortured by demons, are remarkably similar to, yeah. of course, the stories about the aliens uh, having fun with us uh, nowadays with probes. Uh, it's uh, it's it's almost and, identical. And what's kind of awesome is there are people who are out there trying to figure out how to scientifically explain the psychological phenomena that people are clearly experiencing. Mm -hmm. These people are having some sort of an experience that their brain is translating as um, in some cultures a witch or a demon sitting on their chest as alien abduction and probing as a ghost uh, smothering them and and they're starting to learn that in different cases these are failures in how the sleep paralysis takes place um, and uh, it's there are actual chemical biological triggers for why people experience these things yeah I've experienced sleep paralysis quite a bit oh. and <clears throat> and I'm aware of it though so I'm like, this is sleep paralysis. And so it's so once you know, even though it's happening to you, you're able to go, this is sleep paralysis, this too shall pass, and, you, and you're able to sort of not panic about it. I just kind of chill when really? I'm That's feeling sleep. Really? That's still not scary Paral just to feel that? It's, like... well, it's, it it would have been scary if you didn't know what was going on. But mm -hmm. as soon as you understand what's going on, then you just, then you're like, yeah, I'm, I am sleep para you know, paralyzed, but it'll, you know, it'll be gone in a little while and I'll be able to move again. So, so as long as you you understand what's happening and you don't freak out about it, then it's not scary at all. And uh, yeah, so I know I've had probably maybe five or six times, hmm. and it's each and the the first time it happened, it was quite terrifying. But then I figured out what it was or understood what it was, and then no, it's not it's not that big of a deal. So, so Matt, I'd like to know then, what do you think is the most effective way? to sort of get out there and combat this mi this misinformation. And I mean, you come from a long line, I mean, with Carl Sagan, uh, you know, as being, as you said, really the archetype, the one who we all look to as the one who really started to, to define how to combat misinformation. You know, what do you think is the, the most effective ways to do it? I am so unworthy of being say, uh, t described as being in that line, uh, but, but honored. Um, I think Carl was on the right track. These are people who are searching. These are people who want to believe that there is something beyond our human experience. And there is. And it's what the people that you and I talk to, and some of you do as a living, 
as part of your living uh, on a regular basis. There is so much wonder and mystery in the universe. And I've, I have found in talking to some of these folks that it's not that difficult to awe them with some of the things that are actually happening uh, and get them excited about that. Um, the other end of this is that I don't miss an opportunity to give gentle digs at certain widely held pseudoscience beliefs. Uh, I'll find ways on the radio show, uh, and there must be some listeners who've noticed this, to drop the word evolution in whenever I can, it, ha having nothing to do with the evolution of biological evolution. I mean, you know, I'll, uh, I think I asked somebody once, boy, your wardrobe has really evolved. Uh, and, and because I, I think that it's useful to bring these up, but also just to, <clears throat> to, to uh, sometimes bring it up very directly with people. It's happened very rarely to ask, for example, you know, a Matt Gollenbeck, uh, uh, what do you th what do you say to the people who believe that you're hiding the, the photos of uh, you know the Martians staring in the cameras at uh, of opportunity and curiosity? That happens pretty rarely. I think it's 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 in the long run, much more effective just to present the wonder of it all and to present the passion of it uh, the, and the wonder as being as important as the facts that are being learned because people do get caught up in that. You guys have experienced that over and over. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I, I think one side of this that we haven't brought up yet is when you're trying to educate people, you have to approach them from a position of respect and assume that they have the capacity to learn and to grow and to come to under understand a fact-based universe. And, and this is one of those things that we've been very careful to do with Astronomy Cast is to never speak down to our audience, to always assume that they have the capacity if uh, given the proper information uh, in a context that it fits the education that they've received, they have the intelligence. They just may not have the background yet. And so we work to give them that background. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that it's not that they're dumb. It's, it's that they simply lack the scientific education, the scientific literacy that's necessary to employ good critical thinking skills. And, and this is something CosmoQuest and Astronomy Cast and the Planetary Society, we're all working together to try and increase scientific literacy so that we can have a society where people can focus on uh, learning and growing and not getting caught up in the fear that comes with pseudoscience. Yeah, I mean one of the methods that I've really wanted to encourage all of the communities that I work within is that, you know, if a person starts to rant about some pseudoscience or UFOs or whatever, you know, I've really encouraged the people who are debunking that to think not about trying to convince that person because in many cases that person is too far gone that it's about the it's about the audience that's watching oh, yes. that you know so you may have you know one person coming at you with their carefully crafted bigfoot on mars theories um, and they will and they will deeply believe it and there's really no talking them out of it but yeah. then you're going to have this crowd of people that are somewhere on the spectrum of they absolutely believe about bigfoot on mars all the way to you know they just think that's ridiculous and, and that in the way you have that conversation, the way you bring up the rational thoughts, the way you present, you know, alternative theories about what could actually be going on, you're going to convince a certain percentage of them. You're never going to convince the true believer, but it's not, that's, that's really not the objective. The objective is to convince the observers, because then the observers will then not fall into those mistakes down the road and become true believers of yeah. their own. And I really think that that's the, those are the, you, you want to have these conversations in public, you want to be respectful, you want to be calm, you want to dismantle their argument, but never want to win. You don't care to win against that person. You don't want and, to defeat And you don't them. want to defeat the person. You mm -hmm. want to defeat the false information. And it's very important to separate the beliefs from the individual who's capable of learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Nicole, you do a lot of education with younger kids. I know you do a lot of demonstrations and stuff. You know, are you seeing a lot of these kinds of misinformation with those younger crowds? Yeah, and that, that's something we had to we have to step through carefully with kids, especially when we've been invited into the schools to do outreach. Uh, they're they're um, they may not be getting they may be getting some sort of misinformation from home from their parents and their parents are the ones who are voluntarily sending them to us to do astronomy activities. 
um, and we'll occasionally get questions. Of, third graders can have very deep questions about God and the nature of the universe, and can science explain God? And or I, you know, some so and so told me the Earth was only six thousand years old. How can this meteorite have hit millions of years ago? And um, it's somewhere where you have to step carefully because, again, you have a very curious young child who's putting together their own worldview, and uh, you don't want to to say something to them that is uh, going to discourage them. Or that they're going to go home and say, you know, mommy and daddy so-and-so in school said you're stupid. Uh, so there's another level of, of that you have to be careful of there. Um, and so you can just be, be as honest as you can and say, look, this is, well, this, as, you know, as we've been showing you, we do experiments and we collect data. And these are the things that the data are telling us. And, and we talk about um, the ages of rocks and radioactivity. And we can talk about those facts in a way that um, answers, uh, try and answer the core of their question without, um, without closing the door, or, or especially with a big open-ended question, without saying this is the answer and you have to believe it. Um, but giving them the information because their mind is going to keep going at that for years and years. And and we have some good comments over in in the comment thread. Uh, Guido is saying that that I have to admit that I sometimes like to read conspiracy stuff for fun, and I admit I sometimes get in the mood to to watch Ancient Aliens just because it's it's great fiction. Um, and he points out that there are some epic threads on the Bout CosmoQuest forums and thankfully many brilliant minds to combat the nonsense. And this is one of those things that we do over on CosmoQuest is we join forces with the Bout Astronomy Universe Today forums to create a place where people can go and ask questions, get their ideas tested, and find out through a public peer review system what's wrong with their ideas and maybe what's right. Um, and, and then we also have Chris Fury saying that his favorite fi Feynman quote is, from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that there is much more, um, that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are. And then he leaves us hanging, Chris. The results, no, the of, results unknown of unknown irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence rather than the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. I, I think YouTube cut him off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, now I'm about to, uh, you know, as soon as this this episode is over, I'm going to go and see the new Superman movie. Oh, and, speaking and, of aliens. Yeah, and speaking of aliens. And so, Matt, you know, what impact do you think mass media, television, movies, science fiction is having on this? Is this making, uh, you know, scientists' lives yeah. easier or harder? It's, you know, it's a very good question because I could argue it from, uh, from uh, either side. Uh, at least when you go and see Star Wars going into hyperdrive and all the other things that they do, uh, maybe Star Trek's the better, more recent example, um, people do get excited about this vast and mysterious and wonderful universe of ours. I, I would say uh, it's almost comparable to when people... Uh, what was the uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame when Disney tackled the Hunchback of Notre Dame? Now, bear with me here. There is a relationship, and you had all kinds of people from the literary world saying, "Oh, they're Disneyfying this classic of literature, world literature, and what's the world coming to?" But the fact is that a lot of people saw this uh, twist on the, this classic story. And some small percentage of those people probably got excited enough that well, they went on to maybe read the original text, though, to read the original novel. And I think that a lot of what's happening in the mass media does open up that possibility. And there is an opportunity for us to capitalize on it. And I think that in their, uh, to their credit, a lot of the major studios have been very interested in aligning themselves with uh, good spokespeople for science to talk about, okay, yeah, well, we don't really think a transporter would work very well, but here is this grand vision of exploring the universe, and that is something that we're doing right now in, in reality. Um, well, I was going to ask a kind of related question, Fraser, and that was uh, how you folks think the mass media, the most popular traditional media, the major networks, how should they be doing a better job of what they do? I mean, I already gave the the uh, uh, the example that infuriates me the most, which is when Fox News or Fox TV, I should say, uh, supposedly uh, an all-American uh, organization, uh, put on this documentary that said we have not gone to the moon. 
I, and that infuriated me, and I went to schools to talk about that. Um, uh, so clearly there are still mistakes being made, but where do you think that they could be doing a better job and still serving the audience and their stockholders? Well, I think there's two parts to it, right? One is sort of their their journalism side of it. So you think about things like CNN, uh, you know, shutting down a lot of their space and science reporting. I mean, you know, we used to have Miles O'Brien there, who was like the <clears throat> biggest proponent of space exploration on Earth. Uh, you know, clearly taking the title for biggest space nerd with you know with Amy Sure title. You know close that second. <laughs> yeah, close. And I'm not sure. I know I think Miles O'Brien is a bigger space nerd actually okay. than Amy Sure title. He's just been in it longer, but. Um, but, you know, so deep, deep knowledge of space exploration and was there reporting live. And you had a similar situation at a lot of the other report, you know, a lot of the other uh, networks at NBC and ABC and all that. Now they don't have that anymore. So now, you know, all of the big networks, so from a news standpoint, they don't have this, this understanding of space exploration built into their DNA. They've got instead people who are more, you know, they'll talk about, an, you know, an animal interest story and then they'll talk about this mission and the people who are writing this. So, so you're starting to lose this deep this deep knowledge of the importance of space and science and and all of that, e even in just pure journalism, which is really sad. And it's it's weird that people are starting to rely on like us, you know, because because you know it's you know university is run from a kitchen table and we're you know <laughs> you know we're disconnected around the whole world and and it's just like it's just it's very strange to me. Um, but then you know from the sort of the from the media standpoint, I think people are really starting to discover how much interest there is in this kind of speculative science fiction. You know, there's always been a lot of it, but now finally in the last couple of years, people have been really taking it very seriously. When you look at the kinds of directors and actors and, and production quality that's going into these movies like Avatar and The Avengers and, mm. and, and things like that, they're taking this all very, very seriously. And I think that that shows, you know, that, that people want these these stories about space exploration and speculative fiction and all that kind of stuff. So, so I think there's a real big demand, and that's all that's really been dragging all of us forward is this. There's this gigantic demand, and there's a lack of really cohesive response to it. I think one of the most exciting things that's going to be coming out shortly is just bringing out co the new, new version of Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson and Seth MacFarlane, and I mean that's going to be terrific. Uh, you know all the world, the work that um, that PBS does with with Nova and things like that. So I still still think there are a lot of really viable and interesting shows that are being being put out there. Not enough though. I mean, too much Jersey Shore and not enough, you know, <laughs> the universe. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, <laughs> well, I, I I mean I know that uh, my ability to join you ends in about eight minutes folks and so you know I'm gonna use this opportunity to compliment you guys and pass along the compliments of my boss who as I said I was on uh, with Skype uh, recording his regular contribution to planetary radio just before coming into this hangout a thon and uh, how much we believe in what you guys are doing and uh, how supportive we are uh, I haven't when the times I've tuned in I haven't been able to catch Bill's video, but I hope that that's been useful. Oh yeah, we've we've played it twice. We will play it again. Let me switch. Oh, it good over. timing. Well, so I, actually, but... while I queue it up, you have not seen what is our favorite video. So let me. Oh, is the audio not going? Sound. Okay, hold on. Must get audio. Uh, the switch. I saw a moment or two of what looked like Crow the robot there. <laughs> <laughs> it was Apollo it the is robot. Puppet. It is puppet. So while, while you're searching, I'm just going to say that those of you who are watching now, people who may be new to CosmoQuest or people who have been enjoying CosmoQuest and Astronomy Cast and Universe Today and all these other wonderful tools that are largely backed by the people that you see in front of you, myself excluded, um, they need your help now as they never have before. Oh, here's the video. I'll shut up. Oh, I was just changing. Do you want it now or no? Yeah. Okay. It's no. Okay, no, sorry. No it's it's I'm muting it. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> go ahead. So I'll go on with my pitch. Uh, because after all, I'm a public radio guy, so we're used to, you know, <laughs> begging yeah. for dollars here. I may be a little bit more uh, craven than the the folks uh, the other folks who are putting this on. Uh, so I was starting to say, those of you 
especially those of you who are big fans of CosmoQuest. Maybe you've participated in one of their citizen science efforts. Um, I don't think you've ever heard the kind of message that you're hearing today because we've never been in the situation that we're in today. And this, of course, extends across all of public outreach for science, uh, certainly at least in the United States, where we have had, uh, I may not have always seen this way, but it, we've been looked to as the model around the world for science outreach in many cases. This is all in jeopardy. The people that you're looking at right now, the work that they're able to do for you is in jeopardy, in addition to thousands of other scientists and engineers and communicators across the country who have uh, put a good percentage of their blood, sweat, and toil into sharing their work with you and really even letting you join it. This is all now uh, on the chopping block, and that's why it's so important that you support this. Yes, give to CosmoQuest, support this effort, keep CosmoQuest and its affiliated groups in business, but by doing so, you also send a message to the you send a message to the people in the Beltway in Washington where it will make the most difference. You send it to Congress, you send it to NASA where it may most need, need to be heard, and you send it to the White House. That this is something that we folks out here believe in, that science is important to all of us. We're excited about it. We even base some of our voting habits on how science is supported. And the best way to do that right now, the opportunity you have at this moment is to go to that website that you see on the screen in front of Pamela and Nicole, cosmoquest.org slash donate. You don't see it as long as I'm talking, so I'll shut up. But it's cosmoquest.org slash donate. Go there now. Do this now. If you're like the public radio audience, maybe one in ten of you out there, all ten of you are enjoying this, but only one in ten at most is actually going to take the next step. Now's the time to do that at cosmoquest.org slash donate. Folks? Wow, you are terrific at that. Oh, yeah. oh, I approve this science. <laughs> <laughs> you got it working. <laughs> <laughs> Let me play that one more time. Please. I'm Apollo, and I approve this science. <laughs> uh. So, so we have a question from Graham, uh, from Greg uh, Hallam. Halem, I'm so sorry, Greg. Um, he he says, um, "I'm new to this. How is supporting CosmoQuest different from supporting CosmoQuest?" No, what is astronomy cast. Are you so bad, Pelly? You a little tired? Oh, that's the problem. <laughs> okay, sorry. Apparently, my vision was skipping lines. Uh, so, so Astronomy Cast is a sister program to CosmoQuest. Astronomy Cast produces the wonderful video that you see uh, roughly every Monday. It produces the podcast, the transcripts, the show notes. Um, it helps also helps buy us equipment. It was Astronomy Cast that uh, brought bought the microphones that we're using right now, bought some of the camera lenses that we use, all of the video uh, cameras that we've been using. So when you support Astronomy Cast, you're supporting creating multimedia. We do share equipment across multiple programs. Uh, but what you're doing is you're supporting that program. CosmoQuest is separate from that, uh, and uh, CosmoQuest is creating citizen science programs that engage everyday people that could be you in helping teams of NASA scientists explore our solar system, map other worlds, and we're providing free curricula to schools that get kids using NASA data in their classrooms, and while they're doing their homework, they're also helping to discover our solar system. Uh, when you support CosmoQuest, you are supporting the creation of citizen science gateways and educational curricula, and we go out into the public to get people engaged in learning and doing science every day. So it's more than just the media. It's the research. It's the education. It's the outreach. It's all of that going on in this online facility that we call CosmoQuest. Yeah, I mean, our goal with, with CosmoQuest was to, you know, with Astronomy Cast, we were, it's very educational. We're sort of sharing our, our love of, of space and astronomy. CosmoQuest is really our goal to try and get people involved, to give people the tools so that they can actually connect with the scientists to be able to do research and have their work matter. And so it's both part education and part outreach and, and in involvement. And, you know, we see that 
the the future of science is really this blend between um, between the public, the enthusiastic public with with time and energy and interest coming together with the scientists who have access to the big tools and the you know the big telescopes and the need for to do some of this research and they've got the years and years of of experience and CosmoQuest is this way that if you've got an interest in in space and astronomy and you want to know how you can participate and we can connect you directly with the scientists that need your help and that's and really the core of everything we're doing and the development of CosmoQuest actually came out of Fraser basically nagging me for six months with the question, why can't we give the public full access to research centers so that they can be colleagues in research? And finally, while sitting down the day after Dragon Con down in Atlanta, we were sitting in the bar of the Hyatt, and um, we got to talking, got to working on a napkin that I still have somewhere down on my desk. Um, and I said, okay, you're right. Why don't we just do this? Why don't we just build a virtual research facility for the public? There'd been lots of citizen science programs around. Heck, I'd helped build them. But what hadn't existed was the place that sought to provide the public all of the things that I, as a researcher, would have if I was at a top university. So I took all of my favorite aspects of everywhere I've ever been, Michigan State, University of Texas, Harvard, now I'm at Southern Illinois, and so we have the star parties, we have the planetarium shows, we have the seminars, we have a, essentially a journal club with the weekly space hangout, because uh, let's face it, a lot of times with a journal club you uh, read the highlights on Archive X and uh, we're reading the journal articles and presenting them out uh, with the weekly space hangout as well. So we are working to create that place where you can come and do science. You can hop on the forums and say, hey, what do you think of this crazy idea? Hey, come look at this thing I just discovered. And we've designed it for you. Yeah, um, and I think that the newest phase of this sort of grand master plan, um, I am starting like a, sounding like a super villain now, um, is... Uh, <laughs> now is, for a long time. Oh, all right, okay. Is... Um, <laughs> Is the, is the education side. So now, now with the CosmoQuest Academy, we've got these courses. So if people are really enthusiastic, you know, instead of having to go and go to university for 12 years and come out with a PhD, which I'm sure was a very valuable experience for both of you guys, but, um, you know, years. we can... 10 years? Okay. Uh, you know, but if you just want to get yeah. involved today and you've got a job and you want to participate and there's just pieces, gaps in your knowledge that you need to fill, then, you know, then we can teach you galactic evolution and, you know, large-scale cosmology and spectroscopy and these various pieces of the puzzle that will allow you to participate and, and do even more complicated and more interesting science. And, and so instead of it being like, look, go off, get your PhD, and then we'll talk, no, no, we'll talk today, and whatever you maybe don't have at your disposal, we will teach you those pieces to raise the knowledge of the people that are participating. And I think that, I really think that's the future of science and science outreach. Well, this and is something I, that I, I kind of dream of with the Citizen Science Project is we have a uh, very simple task to start, but I want to see more a more difficult task that you can graduate up to. So maybe you are um, you are marking craters today, but maybe tomorrow you'll be doing clean and self-cal on a, a, a radio image and, and doing the Fourier transform steps. I don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you'll learn. But where can I take this course? And, and, and here, here's the thing. We know that there are completely free, massive online courses, the MOOCs out there. Mm -hmm. Our courses are limited to eight participants. We might someday go up to 18 if we get 20-person Google Hangouts, and if that happens, we'll lower our costs. Fraser, make it happen. <laughs> um, I'll talk to them this week. And, and so we're trying to not just provide an experience. We're trying to provide the best experience. And we need your help to do this. First of all, we need you to come and do science. We need you to be part of our community. Um, but right now, as we try and figure out how to handle the funding crisis that kind of came out of nowhere and blindsided me one Friday in March, um, <laughs> we I had to judge a science fair that morning when I got the email saying, hey, we may not have funding. And I was like, yeah. oh my god, don't scare the kids, don't scare the kids, don't scare the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I was driving down the street uh and I I was on hands free um and my bluetooth which had been happily playing a podcast 
uh, jingled at me and I answered it and it was a colleague from another institution saying I think I just found out from Facebook that I lost my job oh. because the president's budget had been leaked and indicating that the funding that we rely on was getting zeroed. Now um, I know Matt has got to uh, has got to head out, so we should probably yeah. probably let him go. So, as we head into Thank that, you, I'm going to play a thing as your. You try hey, to bring on my I'm boss. I'm the science guy here. I want to thank CosmoQuest for allowing me to join this noble and very important effort. The Planetary Society shares your excitement for citizen science and for public outreach. We've been involving people in space exploration ever since Carl Sagan and our other founders created this society back in 1980. I've been a member ever since, since the disco era. And now I have the honor of running the place. I'm the CEO. I like to say that we do three things. We create, we educate, and we advocate. We create projects that scan the skies for dangerous asteroids. We fund the search for Earth-like planets. And we search for life elsewhere in the universe. We educate with our great magazine, The Planetary Report, with our radio show, Planetary Radio, and with events like Planet Fest last summer. And then we advocate in Washington, D.C. and around the world. We advocate for exploration and space science. But wait, there's more. Our LightSail 1 solar sail will soon rocket into orbit. You can learn about LightSail and everything else that we do on our terrific website, planetary.org. I hope it's your homepage. Now consider joining us. Our members have made us the largest and most influential voice in the space interest community. So go CosmoQuest! Together and with the support of the people watching this Hangout-a-thon, we can, dare I say it, change the worlds. Thank you. I haven't seen that yet. That's awesome. So if I could just make an impassioned plea before I bid you adieu. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, Pamela, uh, for allowing uh, the boss to get in on this. And I know that you encouraged him to say more about the Planetary Society than CosmoQuest. Uh, but, You're um, one of our partners. Yes, and very proud of it. But um, the message there, which he amplified when he spoke to me this morning is how frankly we're all in this together and what we're looking at right now the situation that you just described you know uh, people who listen to public radio fundraisers may sometimes get the idea without it being said explicitly that it's a matter of life and death that that station is about to turn off the transmitter if you don't you know cough up your thirty or forty or fifty dollars uh, that's not generally true in public radio it is true in this case. This is a matter of life and death. You have people like the folks that are on camera with me right now doing this absolutely wonderful work. The work that humanity is intended to do and share it with the rest of humanity, that's what this is about. And this is what's in jeopardy. This is what you can help to save. And I do mean save by going to CosmoQuest.org slash donate and doing your part right now. Uh, and you know what we say in public radio, every little bit helps, there are no small donations. Whatever you're able to do will send a signal to Washington, will send a signal to these people here who are so passionate about what they do and what they try, the opportunities that they try to offer you. Um, it is, the meaning of it and the value of it is far beyond the dollars that you may give. But those dollars are worth a lot. So thank you very much, folks. It has been really a pleasure. I look forward to the next opportunity to get together. Might be Dragon Con. We'll see. But uh, uh, if it's before that, I'll be delighted. And keep up the great work. Are we competing against you for a parsec again? Maybe. Oh, probably. <laughs> Dang it. You may be competing against me if Learning Space is in the same place. Yeah, I, I think, mm. honestly, so Learning Space, Virtual Star Party, 365, Astronomy Cast, Planetary Society, all of us were nominated for Best Infotainment Parsec in Podcasting. But I Virtual think we get a uh, new, new podcasting team as well. I don't yeah, know how many do. of the other ones do. <laughs> so so uh, we <laughs> are a community perfect. inflicting science Thank you for being part Thanks of our so much, community. Matt. We we My love pleasure. working with you, Matt. Thank you so much for being a part of everything that we do. Hugs, Bye, Matt. folks. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.
And we have oh. a Twilight Sparkle haired Emily thing. Hey, Hi. I'm the science guy here. I want to thank well, again for a random Bill. Sorry. <laughs> and Bill Nye joining us again. All right, well, I'm going to go take the kids to Superman now. So, uh, have fun. So, yeah, Man of Steel. So thanks for thanks for having me for for this sort of two parter here. That was fantastic. And again, I am impressed at the, your level of sort of fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the final stretch, guys. Go, You're go share. Great. Go share this to your eight billion Google Plus followers. I, I will. And I will share right now. Yes. That will make me so happy. I already did actually. I already shared. Well, keep sharing. And yes, ma'am. I will get at it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm working on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Emily. Bye, Emily. <laughs>